Hello. Welcome to worship on this, the second Sunday after Epiphany. These weeks between Christmas tide and Lent give us the time that we need to focus on the light of the world. The time that we need to listen and look for signs of revelation. Time to tune our ears to hear the call of God speaking to us in the world. Here in Illinois, we have finally gotten some snow. Some of you may have gotten just a little bit of a dusting and others maybe some sort of significant accumulation. Around the church in Champaign and here in Ford County where Ed and I live, we've received more ice and fog than the fluffy white stuff. But there's been enough to provide a blanket of white as a hush settles over the landscape. Our weather reporters have been making a great big deal of this on TV any time that the weekly forecast allows them to put a sun icon onto their board. One meteorologist went so far as to warn people of the dangers of looking at that fiery ball in the sky if it were to appear for an hour or two at some point in the coming week. Mostly, the light is fighting through a dense shroud of gray and white. So it's providential that our assigned texts for this time focus on seeking the light where it has been obscured. Today in worship, we will hear from the Psalms, the prophets, and the gospel about how God's truth breaks in through the gray times, offering light and revelation. To start, let us be called into worship with these words from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in before and behind. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become as night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen.
Hello. Our reading is from 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were not widespread. At the time, Eli, whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Go and lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. This is the word of God. Has this ever happened to you before? You're out with a couple of friends and he starts telling you a story and she interrupts mid-sentence. That's not how it was. After she corrects some obscure detail of his story, he begins again and minutes later she interrupts again. No, 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 that restaurant wasn't even open back then. We went to get pizza afterward, not there. Fine, whatever, anyway. And he's back to telling his story. But she interrupts again, and he finally turns to her in frustration. Who's telling this story? Me or you? A story, any story, is necessarily shaped by the person who tells it. In our fact-obsessed culture, we often lose sight of this truth, naively believing that there is at the heart of any tale only one true version of the story. And if we could just fact-check all the details that were added in by later storytellers, then we would have the truth. Many read scripture in this way. They have a sense that for every biblical narrative there is a real event and that the truth of these narratives has been compromised because of sloppy storytelling getting the facts wrong. 
And for this reason, some are very troubled when the biblical storyteller recounts a different set of details than the ones included in the Bible elsewhere for the same event. Well, I'm not bothered by this. You see, I believe that the truth of Scripture is to be found in the stories themselves, not in the forensic dismantling of details. And to get to the truth of any story, you have to sit back and let the storyteller tell the story without the annoying interruptions concerning the truthiness of every detail of a tale. Now, I don't know who the storyteller is in the story we just heard Ed read to us about a young man, only 12 years of age, who heard the voice of God. But according to the story, it happened while the boy was serving as a temple assistant to the high priest at Shiloh. The high priest was an old man named Eli, The young boy was named Samuel. And already, I like this storyteller, whoever he is, because he's telling this story with flair and creativity, letting us know that this story will be about hearing and about who I call my God and about religious institutions and about how old people and young people encounter God together within the walls of institutions. You see, the name Eli means my God, And the name Samuel means God has heard. The temple at Shiloh is the center of power for the religious establishment of Israel at the time of this story. And the story begins with biting commentary. Two very different men are living in the temple at Shiloh. Samuel has just begun the adventure of manhood, while his mentor Eli is at the end of that journey. Eli's eyesight is growing dim. His vision is failing. And as the story goes on, we realize that no one in those parts expects to see the light of salvation or hear the voice of God in Shiloh. Not anymore. The high priest himself, the one called my God, is increasingly unable to see what's right there before him. The storyteller says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. But then the storyteller helpfully adds, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. So here's an example of what I was just saying. We can hear that particular detail about the lamp as a clue to the literal timing of this incident when Samuel hears the voice of God. We know that the lamp of God which burned in the temple was a symbol of God's presence there and that it would have been filled with oil every evening so that it would stay burning through the dark hours until the priests of the temple awoke to refill it. So we can take that tidbit from our story beller and and debate whether it was 2 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. We can Google sunrise times in Palestine from 3,000 years ago and come up with our own calculation of the time window exactly when this event occurred. But while focusing on the lamp as a clue to a particular fact of the story, we might miss something much more important that the storyteller wants us to hear. The storyteller just said that although the word of the Lord was seldom heard there and visions were infrequently seen, the presence of the Lord had not yet abandoned Shiloh completely. The lamp was still burning, but time was drawing near for it to go out. Dr. Beecher Hicks states this was a time in the nation's history when someone new was needed, not only to bring a nation to its feet, but also to bring a nation to its senses. For young Samuel, leadership would not be born in him, but rather thrust upon him. His place in history would not be his choice, but would rather be his God-determined destiny. Three times, say the scriptures, Samuel's sleep is disturbed. In his time and in our own, this is no time to sleep. I like that. You see, in the the time of Samuel's boyhood, the leadership over Israel was corrupt. Political leadership had been entrusted to a confederation of judges called after they first entered the Promised Land to govern the people. Simultaneously, for the purposes of organizing religious observances, a lineage of priests had been established who would serve the nation's sacred sites. The judges were like state governors, loyal to their particular tribe and empowered to lay down the law for people 
and to enforce the law of Moses, who, you remember, died right before they entered the Promised Land. The priests, on the other hand, were to serve the whole nation, and at the temple they received the offerings of all the people. Eli was from that lineage of priests, and according to a tradition, all of his sons followed in their father's footsteps, and so were actively involved in the running of the temple. Over time, corruption had infected the office of judges so that the interests of the people were not being met by those who had assumed too much power. Dishonesty had all but destroyed the integrity of the temple at the same time. Eli's sons were known to take whatever they wanted from the sacrifices that were brought to the temple. And when young women would come and stay at Shiloh for the purpose of devoting themselves to extended times of prayer, Eli's sons would take advantage of them. In order to unleash God's power into the affairs of rulers and nations, it was time for some new office in Israel, something beyond the limitations of political maneuvering and the easy complacency of organized religion. Our storyteller calls this office the trustworthy prophet of the Lord. It was the office which was thrust upon Samuel at the tender age of 12. So if old Eli could not or would not see what was happening right under his nose at the temple, and if the judges of the people wouldn't exercise their authority with justice for all, then God must call a new leader to speak truth to power and wake up a sleeping nation. But first, that leader needed to wake up. Well, you know I love a good storyteller. A good storyteller chooses their words carefully, selecting images layered with meaning and words that evoke emotion. The dialogue in this story between God, Samuel, and Eli is just wonderful in that way. While Samuel is lying down, the temple is shrouded in darkness. The lamp of God is barely flickering, and into the inky morning night, God calls out, Samuel! Samuel. Literally, God cries out, God has heard. God has heard. Well, what did God hear, do you think? Samuel was given his name by his mother Hannah, who had come to Shiloh for an extended time of prayer and had prayed God would open her womb and grant her a son. When God answered her prayer, she named the boy God has heard. And after he was weaned, she brought him to the temple at Shiloh and gave him to God who had heard her. I believe God also heard the other women who came to Shiloh to pray, those who cried out in grief and pain because of the abuse of those priests. And God heard the cries of the people whose welfare and needs were neglected by both their religious and their political leaders. So God cries out in the night, Samuel, God has heard. All that Samuel understands is that someone is saying his name. He knows he's being called. He assumes he knows who would call him because as the storyteller already told us, no one really expected to hear the voice of the Lord at Shiloh. Samuel has clearly never heard it before. So Samuel gets up and goes to the high priest who is significantly named my God. Repeatedly, Samuel's called by the one true God, and repeatedly, Samuel runs to my God instead. However, on the third time, the Lord says, God has heard. On the third time, God cries, Samuel, Samuel. On the third time, that Eli's own sleep is interrupted by pulls on his sleeve from the upcoming generation. Eli is now truly awake. Eli is truly awake for the first time in years. And this time, while the lamp of God flickers in the darkness, Eli, who can barely see anything, instructs the boy to answer, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Eli understands and accepts that God has chosen to bypass the high priesthood to which he has ascended. God wants to speak to someone else. 
God is choosing to step outside the lineage of established priesthood altogether. God is rejecting temple structure, entrenched religious wisdom. God chooses something completely new. In verse 11, our storyteller has God say, I am about to do something that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. There we go again with the good storytelling, tingle. That's a great word. Are your ears tingling? We live in a time when those on the right and those on the left agree. Established, entrenched structures are failing the people. Those on the right and those on the left both acknowledge corruption, favor-seeking, power-grabbing, and pay-to-play politics have left us with the ideals of our nation on the edge of flickering out. They just can't agree on the direction in which the fingers of blame should point. As pressures for and from social change reach a boiling over point, many are frightened and filled with dread. Our institutions seem to be cracking, our public life forever broken. For some, however, there is hope in this moment. Drawing inspiration from a line of Leonard Cohen's song, Anthem, they quote, there's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. In January of 2015, Dr. Beecher Hicks preached a sermon on this Sunday before Martin Luther King Day entitled, Maybe God's Trying to Tell You Something. Commenting on this narrative about Samuel, he says, of course, to read the story of Samuel is to understand that in order for spiritual or social change to be accomplished, one must first be awakened to the world around you. God's first choice was to awaken the one who would be preacher. Or stated differently, God awakened the church. Sadly, Hicks says, the world no longer seeks moral guidance from the church. It appears the church itself needs guidance. The world has set aside the moral authority of the church because we who have been commissioned to speak have chosen instead to sleep. Awake. These are serious times. As serious as the middle passage, as serious as whips and chains and auction blocks, as serious as Montgomery and Selma and the Edmund Pettus Bridge and Trayvon Martin and all the others who were choked or shot in the street or left for dead because of those who were standing their ground. Well, Dr. Hicks is one of those exceptionally good storytellers. A good storyteller draws us into the story and makes us ask, who am I in this narrative? Am I Eli, growing blind to the troubling realities around me? Am I the established religious order, which has lost touch with its mission and calling? Am I the sons of Eli, claiming the privilege of power inherited purely by chance of birth? Am I ensconced in the safe walls of assumed privilege, asking always, well, what's in this church thing for me? Am I Samuel? still unfamiliar with the voice of the Holy One who hears the cries of God's neglected people. Am I the one God is trying to wake up? Maybe God's trying to tell you something. That's a powerful sermon title, Dr. Hicks. And you're right. It's time. Time for Samuel to wake up.
You are invited now to join with us in a celebration of the Lord's Supper. Taking whatever bread that you have with you now, we remember that Jesus came, the Word became flesh, that we might know life and have it abundantly. And so we partake of this bread, this body which was given for us. In the same way, we also now take the cup, remembering the joy of salvation which is ours. The light that was coming into the world was that we might know the love of God and know it fully in the person of Christ. We now celebrate that light as we partake in this cup with joy and thanksgiving. Thanks be to God.